special day because we're filming at Hamilton College for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive, and I'm very, very pleased to have Milt Phileas with me today, who is the driving force behind this effort. Thank you. So thanks for coming. My pleasure. You know, Spend the time doing it. Right. I've known you for about over five years now, and uh, but there's a lot of holes in what I know about you. And you may prefer it that way. Well, there are some holes that will remain holes. OK. So we'll just fill in a few blanks, if, if you don't mind, and then we'll get to talk about the archive. Um, I know you come from Rochester. That's right. And when you were in your teens, that was the swing era starting. Yes. yes. Can you tell me when that first grabbed your attention, that music? 1935. Why specifically that year? Well, I was uh, 13. And when I was 12 years of age, my father said, uh, son, you're now going to earn your own way. Uh, you're going to earn your keep. And I'll, I'll provide a, a roof over your head and food, but you earn your clothing, your spending money, and so on, which he dreamed to be a way to build character. So I started out, and I had paper routes and an old thing called Radio Mirror magazine routes, and I worked in a grudge store and a grocery store, and, and had, a, had a very busy time. Then I found the drums. And I started playing the drums, and I took lessons from the guy who was uh, head percussionist with the Rochester Philharmonic. And uh, my friend down the street and I formed a dance band. And uh, so we went out, and, and for the rest of my time in high school, we played a lot, made a lot of, from those days, a lot of money. You know, you, you get five or ten bucks for a night, and you thought, oh, geez, I'm on top of the world. <laughs> but I used all that money to buy records. And I just, uh, there's a, there's a uh, record store in Rochester, Levitt's, I think is the name of it. And uh, I, I drove them crazy. I spent every Saturday in the booth in there playing stuff and buying stuff. And I fell in love with Benny Goodman and Artie Shaw, and the Dorseys, the whole, the whole bit. And I had a collection of records that was pretty, pretty damn good, which I retained until the war. And then when I went off to war, my father got them. And fortunately, he taped all the 78s for me. And then we threw them away. Mm -hmm. But that's how I got started. Were your parents um, musical? No. Did they? My Listen father became so. Oh. He, he caught the bug. And he, he caught the bug really during the war. When he was playing my stuff, he thought, that's oh. not bad, you know? And uh, I don't know, I, I, was, I was really hooked on it. Uh, I'll tell you one story that, that remains bright in my mind that a friend of, my, a friend of mine and I were in Washington, D.C. at my grandmother's house. And I think it was 35 or 6, when the Spanish Civil War was going on, whenever the hell that was. And the Benny Goodman band was to play at the Raleigh Hotel, downtown Washington. And we decided we had to see that somehow. So we went down to the hotel in the daytime and welcomed the band when they came in. And uh, Harry James went off in a and a side uh, e exit to smoke a cigarette. So we went out and talked to him and said, geez, I sure would like to see that band. He said, well, he says, I'll tell you what. Meet me here at intermission, and I'll take you in. So we did. We came down that night and went to intermission. James took us in, and he sat me up right next to Krupa on the bandstand, who was my idol, you know. And I had a wonderful time. And, and then Benny came in and gave me the ray, you know. <laughs> so we stayed a couple of sets and then we left. But uh, that was the highlight of my youth. Wow, that's amazing. It's so interesting because I think back when I was that age and uh, I was a bit older, but the Beatles came in, you know. And yes. there was all that flack about them and that, that hype. and. And the girls loved them. And then now I look at my own kids, and they have their own little stars. But yes. The swing guys were your stars. That's right. That, that was the popular Still music. Still are. Of the day. Uh -huh. Still are. If you note, the the uh, the people that we've brought up here to jazz concerts are primarily 
veterans of the swing age. That's why mm -hmm. they're all in their 70s and so on, and they're not going to be around long. But right. fortunately, you have them on tape. Right. So. Um, I've asked a number of the musicians, what is swing? Yeah. Do you have an idea on how to define that? Yeah, it has a beat. Mm -hmm. it's, there's no other beat like it. And, and there, there are people who, who played in the swing area, era who, who weren't swingers. Mm. But you can, I, the minute I hear it, I know it, the beat. Yeah, it's It's, it's a heavy 4-4 four, four beat. And it's, uh, it's heavy, but it's light at the same time. It's totally unlike the, the rock and roll stuff with the, the drummer banging away. I, I, I mean, that doesn't take any talent to do that. But mm -hmm. you see a fellow that, uh, like Butch, Butch Miles, he's the epitome of a good swing drummer. And all, all you have to do is listen to him make rhythm, and that's it. Mm -hmm. you know? And everybody reacts to it. The, the swing people. Did you learn uh, any of that swing drumming from your uh, your teacher at Eastman? Oh no, no, just the rudiments. Right. So after that, it was pretty much listening and uh, yeah. emulating. Well, yeah, I I, I used to uh, uh, I used to do sing 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 with my eyes closed, mm -hmm. you know. And in fact, uh, later on in life, when I uh, was uh, running a shipyard in San Diego. I had a big house and one room was a music room and I had in it huge speakers and my drum set. Uh -huh. And I would come home from work tense and ready to kill somebody, you know. And I'd turn on a record and play it loud as I could and I'd go in and beat the drums and play with it. And that was the way I relieved tension in uh -huh. those days. But uh, it's it's very distinctive. It's 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 a rhythm and it's it's catchy. It, it's lilts. And uh, the minute you put something, I can tell you whether it's swing the swing music or not. Uh -huh. you know? uh, but that that rhythm is still uh, well. When you hear the, the all the concerts we've had, they've all been swing mm -hmm. swing based. Mm -hmm. You know. I don't know that that's the right word for it, or the right term, but that's where it started. I think it's a good term. What was the repertoire that your particular dance band oh, would Jesus. play? <laughs> Blue Moon. Uh huh. Uh, Red Sails in the Sunset. We did a novelty thing called Old Man Mose, and I was the singer. Is that right? Oh, yeah. And we did White Heat, <laughs> Jimmy Lunsford's White Heat. Uh huh. We just bought standard oh. off the off the shop uh, uh, recording uh, arrangements. Uh, Harbor lights, just all the, t the tunes of the time. Mm -hmm. The kids, you know, the kids love to dance to them. So you played like high school dances. Oh and, yeah. yeah, played all of it. My my father had laid down the the rule that I could not go any place they served booze. And. Uh, I pretty much obeyed that until one night I was in a place called the Dutch Mill in Rochester, which is near where my wife used to live, mm -hmm. where I used to live. And they served beer, you know. And uh, we were in the bandstand playing away, and I looked out there, and my mother and father are dancing. <laughs> well, I got help with it, but I actually never had a drink. Uh -huh. I never touched it until I came here to the college. I mean, I, <laughs> All the way through high school and all the way through those those days, I didn't I didn't drink. Mm -hmm. Although I played in many places, really, where they served served drinks, they weren't heavy hitters like they have now. But there were places where they served beer, you know. And most people don't get too drunk on beer. Mm -hmm. Did you have aspirations to do music no. full time? I do now, but I didn't. <laughs> okay. I look. Uh, I look at the fellows that we that I admire so, and I think, God, what I wouldn't give to have that talent, mm -hmm. you know, because it's it's God given the the good ones. Mm -hmm. They don't learn it. You can't learn it. You got it. Either got it or you don't got it. And uh, well, I look at well, like like Kenny Deverne, who's coming up here tomorrow or today. Uh, his talent on a clarinet is unmatched, and and. You know, where did it come from? 
He didn't do it learning scales. I know what he got it from Pee Wee Russell or where, you know, but, mm -hmm. but he's a very distinctive player. And Bob Wilbur, who was here before, I mean, all of them. Yeah. They have, they have tremendous talent. Wilbur, look at Wilbur. He's, he writes and he directs and he plays and he, and he uh, arranges and he's got a hell of a talent. Well, but he didn't, he didn't learn that. Okay. By rote. It seems like a pretty mature attitude on your part at that time to know that, that maybe you couldn't make a living as a musician. Say, Monk, I don't know that I really ever thought about it, to mm -hmm. tell you the truth. Uh, in those days, I, was, I went off to college, and in college here, uh, uh, I didn't play. Uh, we had occasional uh, visits from uh, Eddie Condon, Ernie Anderson, Joe's brother was his manager, and he came up here several times in other big bands, and I, I saw that, but I was kind of out of it, except for that and playing records and so on. Mm -hmm. And I really didn't get active again with respect to dealing with the musicians and the music itself until much later in life. I always remained interested and I stayed with it, but I came to college, I didn't know what the heck I was going to do, and my college was interrupted by the war, and uh, then I thought, well, why plan, you know? I, I went in the submarine service, and mm -hmm. one out of four of us didn't come back. Right. And I thought, well, live it up, man, you know? Yeah. And uh, when I did come out, I had enough credits piled up, so I went to law school. Mm -hmm. And uh, got a law degree and went to California and took the bar exam and never practiced law. Right. But at that point, it was pretty late to be thinking about music, yeah. plus the fact that, as you well know, if you don't stay with it, you lose it. Yeah. You know, it was a drummer especially, if his wrists aren't, aren't working all the time, he, he doesn't have it. Mm -hmm. And while I, I used to sit in once in a while just for laughs with some guys, uh, I, just, I just didn't have the, the knack anymore. What brought you to Hamilton? What about this place appealed to you? Well, uh, when I was a senior in high school, I, I uh, narrowed down the, the places of opportunity to eight or nine. I sent for their material, and, uh, and I picked three of them. My father sent me to each of them for a weekend. And the three were uh, Oberlin, Middlebury and here. And I, I just came here, I felt wonderful, and I, I had, we had some friends of my father's who made me feel at home and so on, and one guy over in the Theater Del House was a buddy, and mm -hmm. so uh, it felt natural that this is where I would most like to be, so I just came. I wasn't looking for anything special. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a little arts education, but I, in those days, you know, college education was a college education. You, you took what you could get. And I have to, I'll say this for the record, that nobody will ever believe it, but the cost of coming to Hamilton College was $400 a semester. I ran across one of the old builds not too long ago. And my dad, this was of course in the middle of the Depression, my dad paid $400 to send me to school. So, uh, Think about wow. that as you pay your daughter's bills, <laughs> sir. Thank you. I'll try to keep it in mind. I, mean, I, just, <laughs> I just saw the uh, minutes of the last trustees meeting. God, they have $32,000 yeah. to come to the school. Incredible. Yeah. Did the fact that it was a men's school have a, an effect on your decision one way or I think it did, but not, I, I didn't realize it at the time. Ah. And, and uh, I'm glad it was. It was a great experience. And you were in a frat? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody was. Oh. In those days, fraternities were very meaningful here. 80% uh, of the population was in a fraternity house. They had to have them for a living. They didn't have the dorms that they have now. And, uh, and they, were, they were good institutions. They were well-mannered, and each freshman would have a senior who looked after him. And for example, I learned how to drink. 
politely. We dressed for dinner every night, and we we learned manners, and, and mm -hmm. we, we were really well groomed because we had kids coming to this, this campus off of, straight off the farm, you know. And mm -hmm. I had a roommate like that, and uh, boy, he's a real gentleman now. Yeah. And he was he, he got that training in, in the fraternity yeah. houses. So it was an education in oh, more yeah. ways than one. Oh, yeah. yeah. It wasn't, you know, like I, the houses uh, before we... When, when I came back and looked at him, I was uh, disgusted. My house was so bad I wouldn't even go near it. Mm. It was a mess, and there were beer cans all over the place. And they, what had happened was that the uh, the sophomores were living in the house because now there were girls in the dorms, and the seniors and juniors wanted to be where the girls are. I see. So there's nobody to keep keep things under control in those houses, and they all went to hell. Every one of them. Mm. So now we're we're in better shape now. This, actually, the the uh, move the trustees made was a very good one. I mm -hmm. think very sound. The yeah. fraternities still exist, but they don't have the houses. Right. I actually I have a quote here from you from a number of years ago, and you said that the class of 1944 was a rare breed, one of the best Hamilton has ever had. That's right. What was the reason for that? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, the, uh, the, we had a librarian named Pilkington who wrote a book when he left about the college and who said that the class of 1944 was terrible and never should have been admitted. And uh, I think his reason was maybe the same reason. That was the first class that did not require a basic uh, uh, ba background of study of Latin or Greek. It was the first time that that we, got, we could get in with a Romance language. Mm -hmm. I got in, for example, with French or German, one of the two. And uh, Latin and Greek had been the re requirement ever since. And if you base your education on that, it's a little different than, you know, much more stilted, mm -hmm. I think, than, than uh, other forms of education. Uh, I think the war had a lot to do with it uh, because uh, Everybody I know who went to that war and came back in one piece is a better man for it. Mm -hmm. And we had some guys who uh, might otherwise not have been as successful. I don't think I would have been if I'd just gone through college and had not gone to law school and gone to California and all the rest of it. I certainly wouldn't have been. And the result is that that class has turned out some pretty good people that have been very uh, very good to this college. Those, those years were called the uh, the crazy mixed up years. Yeah, right. Make sure I get that right. Right. Um, where a lot of the fellows came back and graduated a couple years later than they might have. We all did. Yeah. But a lot of us didn't. Right. A lot of my class never did graduate. Mm -hmm. They went elsewhere. But they still come back to our reunions and they consider this their home. Uh, I don't know what the percentages are, but there's a lot of them. And, and many people went to, went to graduate school, and, and uh, I could have done that. When I came back from the war, I, I, I was 12 hours short of a degree. I elected to come back in the summer and pick up those 12 hours before I went to law school in the fall. But I could have not done that. I could have mm -hmm. just gone to law school. But with the 12 hours, I was able to graduate, which I did in 47 instead of 44. Mm -hmm. What made you uh, pursue the submarine uh, school? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, was, I was in uh, uh, Midshipman School at Columbia. And uh, there were, I think, 1,200 of us. And they put up post or list for what did you want to do? And I got to thinking about the fact that most all the guys who were, who were basically civilians like me got to do landing craft. And I thought that was a terrible way to end your life. Mm. And uh, I could, didn't, wasn't a flyer, but submarine service offered a lot of things. It offered, first of all, 50% increase in pay. It offered 
wonderful food, excellent food, and a pr pretty good life. So, and it was, and it was distinctive. You, you were one, there were, oh, I've forgotten now, five or 6,000 of us in, in the war, that's it. And, and we're pretty distinctive breed, really. So I volunteered for it. And uh, they then uh, set a team around of uh, three people, a commanding officer, an engineering officer, and a Mustang, that is a guy who came up from the ranks and who was rough and tough and so on. And they interviewed each of us. And uh, they, I didn't know how to answer any of the questions. I was a comp you know, I was an English literature major, and the, the engineering guy said, well, what's the difference between AC and DC current? I said, oh, damn if I know. You know, and I just asked about it. And I figured, well, that's gone. I'm, I, I'm not going to, well, as it turned out, there were five of us that they picked, uh, four engineers and me, which obviously was a mistake. Somebody got the wrong number. You know, it, it couldn't have been me. So I went to submarine school. And the first thing they do is they spend two weeks with, with a nut house trying to figure out whether you can stand the pressure and whether you get along with people well and, and schizophrenia and all that stuff. And if you pass that, you're home free. You have to graduate from the school. They won't let you flunk. Oh. I was the only one to pass out of the five of us. No kidding. The four engineers went out to the amphibious fleet. Oh. So there I was, and I was in submarines, and then submarine school. A wonderful time. I guess you don't suffer from claustrophobia. Oh, no, no. It was, well, it, it was, looking back, it was pretty tough, but mm -hmm. uh, when you're young, you know, and uh, there's a war on, there's a war that everybody wants to win, mm -hmm. that was pretty nifty. I enjoyed every minute of it. And you eventually went uh, overseas, oh, yeah. Southeast Asia? Oh, yeah. Well, I, we won't get into that. Mm. The ex exploits in Australia and so on. That's, that's not something we talk about. No? We, not even, in, not even no. in part two of our interview? No. Okay. No, okay. no but it, it, was, it was wonderful. Wonderful experience. Wonderful people. Never met a single person I didn't like in the service, in the submarine service. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just it was a great experience. Where, was there ever a time where you didn't think you were going to come back yeah. from that? Yeah. yeah. That wasn't such a good experience. Right. That was a time that we called brownie shorts. Yeah. Yeah, I had one of those. Uh, that's hard. And uh, as you said, you can't help but become a stronger, better person. That's right. For going through that's that. That's right. That's right. Well, just going through boot camp, uh -huh. you know, if t today you don't have to go to war. If you can handle the boot camp, or say a Marine boot camp, you're a better man, and you're a better citizen, too. Do you think that a draft should still exist today? Yeah, I do. I, th I think it's... I think it's a mistake to uh, to lower the standards mm -hmm. of the people in the service. Uh, I would I would make it an easy draft. I mean, I'd say take you in for a year, a year and a half, and then you go about your business as as uh, I guess the Swiss do that, and some other people. Uh -huh. uh, I wouldn't draft them for four or five years or so on. But uh, I think number one, I think everybody should do it. I think it's worthwhile. I think it's a good experience, and I think it's it's good for you to do that. But uh, uh, the the things they're doing now are, are trouble me. That they can't they can't fill the they're, they're sixty thousand people short. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is that the only service that is full is the Marines, and they're the toughies. You go in there, you get hell. I mean, that's that's the worst. But they have every billet filled mm. by volunteers. So yeah. I don't know what that tells you, but people like a challenge. Yeah. Some. Yeah. 
was the, um, were you fellas able to follow any of the music scene that was happening in the States while you were overseas? Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. And we got, uh, I'll never forget, we got a lot of the elect electric electrical transcriptions, you know, that the guys mm -hmm. did. And there, boy, there's some wonderful jazz on those things. And it's too bad that they ended up the way they did, but uh, we get we get those. I I used to play those all the time. Were those the V discs, or was that something different? Uh, no, these were big. Uh, well, they're as big as LPs, uh -huh. really. And they were they were they were jazz. Uh, well, you've heard Benny Carter and others talk about how they get got a bum deal out of it. But I st there's still a lot of them that are under wraps that you can't get. Mm -hmm. you know. But uh, they shipped those over and, and lots of them, lots of them. And we had movies on the submarine. We had, uh, I saw Destination Tokyo at least 500 times. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys chuckle sometimes at the way the war was portrayed oh, in films. Oh yes, films. oh yes, yes. We'd watch that, that movie in particular was uh, the popular war movie, mm -hmm. the submarine movie at the time. And we'd set it up in the Ford torpedo room. The guys would just sit around and, and with a little projector, you know, and they knew every line. <laughs> and you'd go through it, every single line would, the, the guys would know, you know, <laughs> and laugh. And, so it was so much bull, you know, uh -huh. but but they uh, they got a kick out of it. Yeah, that was a. I'm not sure "special" is the right word, but it certainly was a significant historical time in this country. And oh yeah, when you look back on it, I I just had seen a promotional film that uh, Jimmy Stewart had done. Yes, trying to get uh, pilots, and it worked yeah. amazingly well, yeah. I guess. Yeah. People responded to that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yep, they made a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Made a lot of them, and uh, we never lost. We right. never lost. <laughs> um, let me talk about the music just for a minute. When in at that time, did you or any of your musical, uh, the fans of the music, have make a distinction between? The white bands and the black bands. No. No. And and uh, to be honest with you, when when Goodwin took on Teddy Wilson and Lionel Hampton, I didn't think that was such a big deal. Hmm. Uh, and and uh, the Jimmy Lunsford band that I think God that really knocked me over. Mm -hmm. That was a tremendous band. Jeez. And Showman. Oh. I'm sorry, who? Jimmy Lunsford. Oh, yeah. Oh, Showman, yes. Showman, oh, they, oh yeah. the shows they put on when they played, you know. And, uh, well, we know some of the, some of the uh, veterans of that band, don't we? Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, Duke Ellington, Count Basie, uh, Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, I didn't make, there was no distinction really. Mm -hmm. And and I don't think the people in my group gave any real thought to the fact that that a white band would take on a black player or vice versa. Much more likely than a black band taking on a white player, by the way. But, right. but there was a, I didn't sense any of what I feel now out there that, that there's, there's, some, there's some strife brewing that, uh, mm -hmm. Some people who shall remain unnamed say that there are no whites who know how to play jazz. Well, mm -hmm. That's just plain hooey. It's it's distressing that. What well, is distressing? It's not getting better, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it's just it's just uh, uh, was never never a, a, a thing when I was. I mean, black guys and white guys are. Went to enjoyed music together. They played together. Uh, I remember spending an evening with the, the Allington band backstage, and uh, Johnny Hodges trying to put the make on my friend's wife, and you know it was, it was normal. 
And uh, when Joe Williams, way back when, uh, uh, Joe and I were friends for years, and we, we never had a question of, he called me his, his white brother, and I'd call him my black brother, but the, we never had a racial mm -hmm. problem. And I don't think, well, he and his wife did, but that's another thing. Mm -hmm. So you came back from the service and uh, went to law school. Went here. You came and here. And then to law school. And to law school. And then right to California. Right. Um, <coughs> the, the business that you got into, was it? Uh, serendipitous somehow? How did that actually happen? Well, uh, I went to California. I studied the summer for the, in June of 49. I studied for the bar, took the bar in November, October, and went looking for a job. And all the law firms said, uh, yeah, we love you. You look great. And you went to a good school. And when you pass the bar, come on back. Well, I had a, a wife and a child and a pregnant wife at that. Mm -hmm. And I needed some dough. So I heard of a guy, a, a big guy in town who needed an administrative assistant with legal training. So I thought, well, I'm try that. So I went to see him, and I got the job. And I went to, went to work for this fellow who uh, owned a bank and a bunch of other stuff in town. And I worked for him for a year or so, and then one of the things we owned was a little shipyard. And uh, somebody was stealing from the shipyard, yeah. so he called me and asked me, would I go down to the shipyard and sign on as assistant treasurer and see if I could find out who it was? I said, OK, but I, remember, I don't want to stay there. I want to come back <laughs> to the bank. you know." want to be uptown because I was still thinking I was going to practice. Uh -huh. And I was right in the middle of everybody who was anybody in town. I, you know, I had every connection that could possibly be in this little town. Anyway, I went down as assistant treasurer. And the first day, I discovered that the crook was, was the treasurer. <laughs> the first day you discovered first that? First day, yeah. And <laughs> so I reported that. And then I had to stay on as treasurer, you see. <laughs> and and uh, I stayed for. Oh, five or six months, I guess. And I got very upset because the company wasn't doing anything and the management stunk and there was no future, you know, nothing. Mm -hmm. So I quit. And I resigned. And uh, that night he came out to my house and talked me into coming back to run the shipyard. So I did. And uh, had a hell of a time. That's an amazing leap for, yeah. for a young man. To, yeah, I didn't to know anything about it. My, my objective, incidentally, was to make that a, as good a shipyard as could be, but to build a submarine. That was my objective. Wow. Never made it. Wow. Shipbuilding is a whole, I mean, amazing field. We could spend hours about. on that. Yeah, OK. Well, Let's not. OK. <laughs> but you went from there um, to the uh, a conglomerate that, that had a whole bunch of different things yep, going on. That's and, right. Yeah. Did you move from those things uh, because you needed a new challenge? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's uh, just lay that. The shipyard we built into a big thing. Mm -hmm. It's now the biggest shipyard in the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And it was the biggest employer in San Diego at the time I left. We sold it to the Kaiser Enterprises. And after a year and a half with Kaiser, I decided I didn't belong mm -hmm. in that big operation. So I told my good friend Edgar Kaiser I was going to leave and, and did. And I went back with the guy who owned the shipyard in the first place. Oh who now had a bank and a cannery and a bunch of tuna boats and a, a yellow cab company in LA and San Francisco and this bus line in Kansas wow. City. So I became the executive vice president of that company and ran all those businesses. And uh, <clears throat> I was doing all right, I guess. And 
then I discovered that uh, there was some phony fi financing going on. I was on the board, incidentally, of the company. Mm -hmm. And I discovered that uh, my boss, the banker, was playing games. And uh, for example, I had a, a several million dollars worth of tuna sitting in a warehouse, canned tuna, and found it was hocked to three separate banks. So I said, we can't do that, you can't do that. He said, oh yes, I can. I said, well, okay, but not with me, you can't. So I left. Hmm. It wasn't, uh, it was just that I didn't want to be part of it. Yeah. Later, it, several years later, it collapsed. Uh -huh. And uh, too bad, because he, he was a nice guy, but he just didn't understand that the law was made for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, had, he and Dick Nixon were friends and they, you know, <laughs> they thought alike. I see. Well, I can tell from, from your record collection that you must have been collecting all those years. Yes, yeah, somewhat, but uh -huh. mostly uh, after, I, af after the law school and so on, that's when I really picked up on it. Uh -huh. So while, I, while I was in the Navy and here, I didn't have any time to do it. But, right. But I did then, yes. Is that, uh, what were the, the years when you first started to meet these musicians? Because I've been really amazed over the years how many of them you've gotten to know. Oh, and how dear. did that come about, from your travel? Jazz parties. Uh-huh. Jazz parties. Uh, I would say in the early 60s it started. Uh, I started out, I went to, uh, well, I, I knew some people just from rolling around town in San Diego, but uh, I really met them when I, at the Dick Gibson's parties. And I went to 25 of those straight. And, and I went for the same reason that I, that I wanted to do the archives. I knew that the following year there'd be some I wouldn't see again. Mm -hmm. And that was true every yeah. year. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I, I went to those parties and uh, Dick and I became very friendly and, and I, I went to some of his private parties and so on. I got to know a lot, a lot of these people. And uh, some of them, I became very friendly with, and some of them were just nodding acquaintances. They're, I have found them as a group to be tremendous friends, uh, very loyal. My definition of a friend is a guy you can call at 3 a.m. and say, I'm in jail, come get me out. And they all would, mm -hmm. the ones that I know. So. Uh, uh, They've been almost my best friends all these years, mm -hmm. a lot of them. Yeah. You got to travel to New York a number of times uh, over oh, the years and yes. hit those clubs. Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a veteran of the Metropole. Uh -huh. In 1958, seven or eight, uh, is when we started pushing the shipyard. Mm -hmm. And I, I bid on some ocean-going freighters and passenger ships for uh, uh, three lines in New York, U.S. lines, more McCormick and American Export. And I had to work the Maritime Commission in, in Washington as well. So I was on a, a schedule to take me to the East Coast two and three times a week. When I was in New York, uh, what was involved was going down in the morning, down to the, where the, all the marine activity is, calling on somebody, having a drunken lunch with them, and then <laughs> going back to the hotel, take a nap, and then spend the evening at, at, the, at the place. And the Metropole, I'll never forget, there's a, there a bartender there named Blackie who was my buddy, you know. And, and my secretary back in San Diego knew that if she wanted me, that's where I'd be. Uh -huh. And everybody was there. You know, uh -huh. in those days, that's the only place. There were, no, there, you know, Ryan's and all those places were gone. Mm. This was the only place that jazz really existed. And hell, they'd have the Hampton Band and the Ellington Band and the Basie Band and 
and uh, uh, oh, they got Red Allen and uh, Higginbotham and uh, uh, oh, they're all there. Coleman Hawkins, Coleman Hawkins and Roy Eldridge were in a, were, had a group there. They played every night, yeah. and there's a big band. You ever been there? No, Metropole. Well, it's a big bandstand behind a bar and standing room and then booths along the side. And uh, they just change every half hour. And, and it was, everybody's having a good time, you know. Red Allen was there greeting everybody at the door when they came in. And, and uh, uh, it just, it, it was a wonderful time. That, that you really, if you didn't like the music, you had to like it there. It mm. was, there's everybody. I, I never realized until later how great it was. I never realized. I thought all these names, you know, and some mm -hmm. I didn't really know well. And, and later as I collected records and saw, Jesus, I know that yeah. guy. You know. Right. And they, uh, uh, they, they just put on a terrific show. And Buster Bailey, remember Buster sure. Bailey? And uh, he was a friend. Dizzy was there. Did they charge to get into this place? No. That's oh, amazing. No. How did they pay no. the musicians? <laughs> you go in and buy a beer. And, no, I, I'm not sure. They had a, a second story. They may have a, may have had an entrance fee because they put the bands up there. You may have cost you 50 cents or a dollar uh -huh. to get in. But, but you go there and I just sit there and drink, you know, three or four bottles of beer in the night. Terrific. It was marvelous. And uh, and as I say, you stay at the bar, and then as these people came off, they swing by the bar and say hello and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. You know? And uh, I try, I tell you, I'm trying to think of the cozy coal. Mm -hmm. Cozy was there, and it just everybody who was anybody in jazz played in that place. They mm -hmm. had all night long. They started in the afternoon, and went all night long. Wow. And uh, it was, you talked to any of those guys, they were all there. They yeah. all played. Well, you, 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 uh, you interviewed Saul Yeager. Yes, indeed. Didn't you? <laughs> Saul was there. For a very long time. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was about, well, this won't be funny. He was, he was about the least talented <laughs> fellow there. You know, he was a nice guy. Yeah. And he was so proud of the fact that he taught Steve Allen how to play the clarinet for the Benny Goodman story. Right. <laughs> and uh, oh dear, there's another clarinet player, Dixie style. Oh, you know his name too, I can't remember it now. But Wasn't that fellow that ended up with uh, Armstrong, was it? No, 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 oh, no, no. Okay. No. But uh, oh dear. What was his name? Well, You've got some of his records in the yeah. collection. Okay. <laughs> well, you had mentioned uh, San Diego as a little city. It was when that. you went out there. It was that. amazing what, what has happened. We had three hundred thousand people. Yeah. Now we have over a million. Uh huh. It was a hell of a town, mm -hmm. and it was it was like no other that I know of that some young kid like me could step in there and mm -hmm. and with a couple of lucky breaks and the hell I was. Ahead of everything, mm. over the over the time I was there, I I was in the Y and the Boy Scouts and the Civic. I was Chamber uh, of Commerce, was president that right? of the chamber yeah. for a couple of years and all that stuff. And at the at one point, uh, the city fathers wanted me to run for mayor, and I told them I couldn't afford to because the twelve thousand dollars that was the the stipend for the mayor was exactly the amount of my alimony. <laughs> so they said, well, well, we'll make it up to you. I said, oh, no, no, we don't do that. <laughs> but uh, I, without blowing smoke, I could have been elected mayor easy. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the owner of the pa newspaper, Jim Copley, took a shine to me. And uh, the paper was never published without a picture or a quote from Phileas. Do you have any of those? Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, I got Good. a, my wife called and threw them in a box and uh -huh. a lot of that stuff. My yeah. father, who lived there for a number of years before he died, 
really got, well, he was very proud of it, I guess, but he just kidded the hell out of me. He says, every time I pick up the paper, he says, Phileas says. <laughs> well, I, you know, that happens here, too. No. Yeah. No, <laughs> I no. think it does on occasion. <laughs> no. Well, it was. In those days, it, it was. It was a small town, and it was a wonderful place. Uh, uh, we're trying to get things done out there now, and it's just not the same thing. Mm -hmm. We had a—you could get eight or ten guys together, the right eight or ten guys, and do anything. You could build a skyscraper, you could build a bridge, whatever. Because mm -hmm. these guys who all had big interests in town. They owned banks or this, that, or the other thing. And if they wanted to do something, they could. Mm -hmm. And that's why how we build a city hall, the present city hall. That now they want to change it, and the civic theater and all that stuff was all built mm -hmm. for these people. Decided we ought to have it. Uh, no more. San Diego is a, a, a buy station now. It's not. I see. See if the banks, for example, have all been absorbed by Bank of America and Wells Fargo and those guys from up north. And the people who are sent down to manage those banks are just marking time, waiting to go back up north so that can continue their career. So you can't really get them interested in mm. in, in the kind of things we did. That's that's the big problem in San Diego. Yeah. There's no leadership anymore. But when I was there, it was just a bunch of us, and and uh, we all wanted good things for the community. Mm -hmm. So. We did a lot. Let's talk about uh, Joe for for a bit. When did Joe you first? Who? Joe uh, Brown or Williams? Say, well, let's talk about Joe Williams. Okay. Um, when was the first time that you actually got to know him? How about the first time I saw him? Uh huh. I was back here on a shipbuilding expedition with my chief engineer. And the two of us went to Birdland, and we had the table about so big in the front row, <laughs> the Basie Band. I had didn't know Joe Williams from the Hill of Beans, and we were sitting there talking very seriously about a problem, you know. And all of a sudden, I looked down there—the biggest feet I've ever seen in my life, <laughs> huge feet. And I looked up and up and up and up, and here's this big, ugly black man. You know, and uh, it was Joe, and he started to sing, and we thought that was pretty good. And uh, then I, I started collecting his records. After that, this was in the fifties when he mm -hmm. first sprung out with the Basie Band before he went on his own. And uh, as you may notice from the collection, we have all of mm -hmm. Joe's records, all that we know of, anyway. And uh, I was very enamored of his talent. Still, am. I thought I, I believed that he never received the recognition he should have. That as a blues singer he was terrific, but on a ballad he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. He's he just got a beautiful voice. And uh, a couple of his uh, of his uh, songs, a couple of his recordings, I have used. To woo my wife, mm -hmm. sitting over there. So it's very, very dear to me. Yeah. And uh, I guess the next time I, I really saw him and got to know him was, I was in uh, Chicago. And I was it was a snowy night, and I was on my way from the Blackstone Hotel to the. The one that has the pump room uh, across town. Anyway, so I'm in a cab and we're driving down Rush Street, and there's a place called uh, New Orleans or something like that. It's a New Orleans type name. And it had big letters, Joe Williams. I said, Stop the cab. <laughs> and I got out and I went in, and I sat in the front row. And we started talking between sets, you know, and finally he said, Well, come on back. So I went in the back room. And sat there all night, and we talked about everything in the world, race relations, uh, you name it, and became very close, mm. and the, went from there. Yeah. 
What was his uh, view on race relations at that time? Anything that you can remember? He thought it was pretty stupid. He thought the whole thing was pretty stupid. Mm. He was, uh, he was, I, uh, he was hurt, but I, I, I think, for example, he and his wife had problems. She was a little white English girl, as you know, and there are people who frowned on that. They don't so much anymore, but at the time, in fact, his father-in-law was very upset when, the, when oh. he married. Then, then he found out that, that, the gal, that the guy that his daughter had married was a famous singer named Joe Williams, and he said, then he became very proud. I and he, br he bragged everybody in this little British village that his daughter was married to Joe Williams. And when Joe Williams came to town, he was very proud of him. So he thought, you know, the initial reaction was dumb. Uh, he, was, uh, he was proud of black people when they were good. He, uh, I think he appreciated talent wherever it was. Uh, I think he was he was extremely concerned about people, black people who have a thing about white people who are prejudiced in in that sense. Uh, I don't think he I don't think he'd ever let race would have let race interfere with what was right. Mm -hmm. I, I I just never found anything to object to in his attitudes. Did you find the same type of feeling in the other fellows of that era that you got to know, like Milt Hinton? Well, I think so, but I don't know him that well. Uh -huh. uh, Milt Hinton, uh, I, I'm pretty sure, is, is broad-minded about anything. But he is from an era where you don't display your feelings, yeah. you know. And most of the black guys I know, like Terry and Sweets Edison and people like that, they, we, you just never get on that subject. Uh, you know that they like you. You know that you're their friend mm -hmm. and that there's no color bar between you. But I don't think you ever get uh, far enough in their innermost thoughts to know what they think. Mm -hmm. uh, Milt Hinton, for example, his first memory was three years old, was looking out the window to see his uncle hung mm. by the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, you know, you gotta, that's gotta do something to you. And I always wondered how Milt could be so broad-minded and, and accept right. whatever came along with that in his, in his head, you know. I, I think, I, I think it had to leave a scar that, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, Milt and, and Mona have millions of white friends. I mean, boy, there's nothing like it. Yeah. More so than anybody, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they attract uh, people want to be near them. Yes. You know, there's yes. something about them nice that, people. that make you feel They're good. They're nice people all the way. Yeah. Uh, the Basie band over the years was one of your favorites. Well, they produced, right? they produced a lot of great musicians. Yeah. Did you have a particular era of that group that you, that you liked the most? Well, the one I knew the most was uh, in the 50s and 60s of Frank West and, and uh, Frank Foster, Marshall Royal, mm -hmm. uh, Joe Newman. The, the, that was the group that I guess I was most familiar with because that's when most of the recordings were made that I had. Uh, it went on and, and uh, there were other guys that came out of there, Lockjaw Davis, for instance. Uh, last time I saw him, he was at a Gibson party. He'd had cancer and he'd been told never to play again. At the end of the party, he grabbed a sax, mm -hmm. and then he died. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been a great year to live through for 
for you. And uh, as I've said a num number of times, I always felt like I was born in the wrong era. Well, <laughs> you certainly don't have what we had. Yeah, no. it's true. No. I, uh, I just can't stomach most of the stuff I hear today. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. And I uh, always hearken back to Louis Armstrong, the boppers, and this, uh, what the hell song is it he does it in? Oh, uh, uh, the uh, Whiff and Poof song. Oh, yeah. You got a line in the Whiff and Poof song about the boppers with their Haiti hay and stuff. But, <laughs> right. Uh, I can, you know, I, 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 I still understand, still don't understand a lot of the people who are important in jazz some years back, you know, that Ornette Coleman, and, I mean, God, I'll never forget, I, I, uh, I was at the, uh, the jazz festival in, uh, oh, Northern California, what the hell, uh, uh, I think I know what you mean. Mon Monterey. Monterey. Monterey, thank you. The Monterey Jazz Party, and I went out to go to the bathroom, and I came back, and there was this terrible noise. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the Woody Herman's band was there, and the Ellington band was there, and a lot of great guys, you know, and there's this terrible sound, and there's this guy up there with a white plastic <laughs> saxophone. And I thought, for God's sakes, what's going on here? <laughs> and and uh, that was Ornette Coleman, uh -huh. the first time I'd heard him. And, and it just didn't make any sense to me. Still doesn't. But people like me are dying off. There aren't uh, many of us left, yeah. you know. Well, he was innovating, but what he was innovating yeah. was... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, was like, just, it, 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 it wasn't musically pleasing to mm -hmm. me at all. Did you even notice that? Um, and he doesn't swing, by the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> when That's you came true. back Those from the war, those guys don't yeah. swing. Uh, when they you came back from the war, did you notice? Did you sense this bebop thing happening? Was it? Was it? Was it in the musical press that you can remember, like downbeat and all this in, in the late forties? No. Okay. No. Just trying to get a sense of. I think how, the fifties, yeah, but in the right. late forties, no. The, the the press had to do mostly with with the downfall of the big bands mm. and uh, uh, I, I guess Dizzy got some some press but if you look at the uh, at the downbeat and metronome uh, contest for the musician of the year you won't find Dizzy in those years mm -hmm. you will then in in the fifties you'll find Dizzy and Charlie Parker and people like that yeah. And uh, and the musician, they're, they're good musicians. They really are. Those guys. I just don't understand some of the things they do. Mm -hmm. What was your uh, take on how come the, the reason the big bands really disappeared? Well, I think probably it was. Uh, television for one thing and uh, just uh, uh, a lack of interest and I don't know I don't know why really we had all these these dance halls that closed down all mm -hmm. of a sudden uh, the radio see the radio stopped that the, the one of the big things about the big band era was the radio support if you lived in this coast, you could start about 10 o'clock at night and turn on your radio and there'd be remotes from all over the world. And every band you can think of was on. You know, and, and if you listen to, uh, what the hell's his name who does the, the yearly thing, uh, Chuck Cecil. Mm. You ever hear Chuck Cecil? No. Well, Chuck Cecil is, has run programs that 
the hits of 48 and 49 oh. and so on. Mm -hmm. And he always opened by talking about these dance halls. And, and we all know where they were, you know. There was a Palladium uh -huh. in, L in L.A. where Br Goodman broke through. Yeah. There was Glen Island Casino over here, and there's a new, uh, Frank Daly's Meadowbrook, and and Boston. Every place there, there were dance halls all over the country that were known because they were broadcast from there, and that's how these bands were made. That's how Goodman was made. Goodman mm -hmm. was made because of the broadcast on the Camel Caravan. And, and that's really what, what held it together. And these bands would travel then from place to place, and they had a, they had a built-in following. And that all stopped. When the war came along, it all stopped. And mm -hmm. Petrillo, of course, had his hand in it. He, mm -hmm. he killed it for a while. Yep. And uh, the people who <coughs> continued, and the ones who have continued to this day, you can count on one hand, one finger, practically. <laughs> right. You know. Les yeah. Brown. Yeah. Welk. Welk's no more longer. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about it. Yeah. They, they just aren't. The Basie band without Basie, and all the ghost bands, of course, are right. around. But, and they're still making a living. Yeah. I think the Basie band is probably the truest to at least they have a steady personnel. You know, some of the other ones come in and use local guys sometimes. And uh, well, I, I think that's right. But I think the truest band is the Artie Shaw band hmm. because Artie Shaw runs it. I was not aware of that. Oh yeah. Oh. Artie, Shaw, when that band was formed, Artie Shaw formed it. He picked Dick Johnson to do the clarinet. Uh -huh. He picked the arrangements, he rehearsed them. When that band was uh, relatively new, I, I heard them at Disneyland. Disneyland had a, a program in the summer where they put two weeks of different bands. Mm. And I was down there one night and I went to hear them. And Artie Shaw was there on the sideline watching it. And he refused to ever play. He never played again. But he was very interested in seeing that that band. So, to me, they were the, the truest to the arrangements that Artie Shaw used to play. Yeah. They were the closest to that. Now, the, the others, the Dorseys and the rest of them are, not, are not, nothing like it. But that band sounded better. They were all young kids. It sounded better than the, than the Artie Shaw band did in the 40s, mm -hmm. in my view. So I, I haven't heard them lately, but I suspect they're still good. I booked them here. You know, they came back here for, uh, for a dance, mm -hmm. that, that same band. Yeah. Went over in the gym. God, the acoustics are so <laughs> awful. I sat there and I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I'd forgotten how bad they were. Right. You can come back the next day and oh, listen geez. to the echoes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was terrible. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your your faithfulness and your support of Hamilton College, and I'm impressed and uh, by the the group of men from your class and from others back then who have had a lifelong commitment to this college. And yep. can you explain why? I've often wondered. Uh, the, the people, the, the people here, did a terrific job of injecting us all with some kind of fluid. Mm. Uh, we came out of here thinking Hamilton is a wonderful place, and we never changed that viewpoint. I can't understand, for example, my own kids who went to other schools, uh, which I would consider the same kind of school. I mean, small. Mm -hmm. And so on. And don't give a damn. They don't give them any money. They don't care. They, they you know, they get. I, I just I said, why don't you ever go back? Or why, you know, they're just not interested. Mm -hmm. They got an education. They got out. Uh, I could give you an example of of the difference. I think that when uh, when the war ended, this college took. 
uh, Carnegie dorm and converted it to apartments for veterans with wives. So each one of the three men apartments was equipped with a dish cupboard and a refrigerator and a stove and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they practically gave those to us when we came back. I lived in one the summer I was here. Mm -hmm. uh, they put a uh, laundry into under Buttrick, and it was we all moved in. And there was 24 couples over there in that in that building, and we had a hell of a time. And then they built a village that has now been removed back at the Alpha Delta House. So they had a concern for us. Okay. Mm -hmm. I left there and I went in one day out to Michigan. Went to Ann Arbor, registered for the law school and said, now where do I live? Huh? <laughs> and I had a hell of a time. In the middle of the winter we moved three times in that damn town and ended up in a scummy place where I spent the rest of the three years. Yeah. But the point was nobody cared. Nobody cared. And you were a number. Uh, my classes were as big as the whole college here, oh. you know. Yeah. And and I and I must say that I did well in the school. I became very friendly with the professors. I was a member of the honor society that threw all the drunken parties and stuff, you know. <laughs> and so I knew them better than most. Uh -huh. But I still have no regard for that school at all. I've never been back. I've never given them any money, and I, I I'm just not interested. So there's a difference. It's an attitude, I think, mm -hmm. towards the students. I mean, here, how my freshman year, every second Saturday or so, my roommate and I would go to Utica and have a spaghetti dinner with two professors and just talk and come back, you know. It's a totally different attitude, a totally different experience. And as a result of that experience, I've insisted that my kids at least start off in a small liberal arts college and get at least two years rather than have to go face the crowd. And we, we were, uh, the other day we drove down to Ithaca and toured Cornell. Mm -hmm. My God, mm. you can't even move. You can't park a car, you can't do anything. And I thought, what a difference, you know, yeah. what a difference. I think it's the type of college it is, and I'd be surprised if it isn't duplicated in schools like uh, Williams and Amherst and so on. I, I think it's the attitude and the life you lead with the school, the, 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 mm -hmm. the relationship between you and the school. The fact that uh, Gene Tobin has a thing over here every week for the kids to come talk to him. And, I mean, that doesn't exist in, in other schools. Right. I think that's what makes a difference. And I don't think it's our class alone. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we are very high on the list of uh, uh, graduate donors to our alumni fund uh, nationally. We're in the first 10, I think. Mm. And uh, we, we have a good, good alumni. That, that, that's incidentally what makes this college is the alumni. Absolutely, I can. That's the whole, that's the whole ball game. And the people who run it are smart enough to know that, so they cater to the alumni. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's the difference. Yeah. Well, Let's hope it'll always be that. I hope so. And it seems to be continuing. If you, if you yeah. attend reunion weekend, you get that feeling. That well, I think I think that, that they've done such a wonderful job. You know, Joe Anderson, who's no longer here, uh, caused a lot of problems, but he did a lot of great things too. Uh -huh. I think the birth of the gold group was a, just a genius idea. And that's been copied now by a lot of colleges that mm -hmm. have duplicated it. But, but uh, that was his idea originally. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it has helped so much to bring new alumni into the fold here. Mm -hmm. but, and the senior gift every year. The kids, the people quite care about the college. Yeah. That's the difference. Well, you have a beautiful building named after you and uh, oh, of, you know no. but I think the most lasting thing of course is going to be this this jazz archive and I uh, I'd love to just actually hear again how this idea came to your head well 
it started with the uh, with the Gibson parties in, in Colorado Springs and later in Denver, when I realized that uh, every year some people did not appear again. They were gone. And they used to pay tribute to them. And I thought, geez, there they've gone, and there, there's nothing, you know, just really nothing behind, left behind. And then uh, in, uh, uh, I forgot what it was now, Joe Williams and Milt Hinton were sitting down at the Alexander Hamilton Inn across the table. Joe was on one side and I was on the other, and they started talking. And they went on with these, these anecdotes and so on. I said to Joe, geez, we ought to be yeah. taping that, you know? Well, I had previous to that tried like hell to get Dick, Wilson, or Dick Gibson to do something. I said, we have to do something to preserve jazz. We have to, you know? And he had a couple ideas. I said, okay, I'll fund it. So I got him $50,000, I think it was, to, to, for matching, to match, and then we'd go ahead. We were going to do some things, and, mm -hmm. and not like the archives, but sort of like it. And uh, he just never got off his duff. He just, mm -hmm. Dick, uh, Dick Gibson did a lot for jazz, but basically he was a bum. And he just never did anything. Mm -hmm. And so we canceled that. And I kept, I had been querying people, how, you know, what can we do to preserve this? And uh, Dave Berger, you know David Berger? Yes. David Berger is Milton's Jewish son-in-law, or son. His white Jewish son. Right. <laughs> and Dave Berger called me and he said, uh, I have an idea, I want to I want to do Milt's life and all his old friends and so on. And he said, I'm going to apply to the uh, National Endowment for the Endowment Arts. Endowment for yeah. the Arts for the money, but I may I may come short. Can you help me? I said, sure. I said, how much are you talking about? He said, oh, probably 50000 I said, yeah, I can do that. So a year passed. Dizzy Gillespie died. That triggered it. So I called and said, where the hell is the thing? You know? I said, here, Dizzy's gone, and that's one of the key guys, yeah. you know. Milton and Dizzy were friends and all that. And he said, well, they, they wouldn't fund it. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me? He said, maybe I can. So he came up with a number of... I don't know, 250, 300, something like that. And uh, applied to, uh, to the foundation, and I engineered a grant. Uh, we, could, we had a problem in that uh, we, could, we had to give the grant to a, 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 an IRS-cleared institution. Mm. And the only one he had was Temple University. And he said, I don't trust those people. He taught there. He said, I don't trust those people. And I said, well, maybe I know a place where we can put the money and they'll dish it out if you need it. So I took the thing, and, uh, and Gene Tobin was in. And incidentally, in between was this conversation with Milton Joe. That's what really got me triggered with the right. day. Yeah. And uh, I gave Gene the, the uh, grant request and had him read it on the red eye coming back here, and he, he thought it was great for historic purposes. Gene's been wonderful throughout this. And so he called, and I said, okay. I got a hold of Berger. I said, Hamilton College will do it. Said, we'll put the money in trust at Hamilton College, and as you need to, you bill them, you mm -hmm. can draw on it. So we started that, and then we tried to make a, a, an arrangement with Berger, and it turned out that mm. that he was after a lot of dough, and he it just wasn't the right thing. And then <laughs> we said, well, let's ha let's have Hamilton do it. We got the money. Yeah. Well, they had returned the money, but I got it back again. And uh, Joe Anderson and another alumnus rigged up a deal to uh, to do it that didn't make any sense. 
So we canceled that, and then Mary. Uh, Mary Kopsha. Yeah, but I. Uh, Terry. Yeah, uh, uh, we were right at a break with, with the head of the thing. Joe was gone, and Dick had just come in. And Dick came to see me in, the, in, in San Diego. And I explained to him this thing, and I said, God, it's dead. I said, I'm, gonna have, mm. I'm looking for another school to put it, someplace to put it where it'll get done. You know? He said, well, let me try it. So he came back, and that's how Mary got into okay, it. Okay, okay. And uh, you know the story from then. Right. Then it, it went like gangbusters, and, mm -hmm. and uh, I was fortunate enough to convince you guys that you should go to jazz parties. And, yes. Because <laughs> Joe was going to go to everybody's house, you know. It would, never would have worked. Right. And uh, that way we gave Tim some fun, too, so Tim That's could right. come and, and see the world, you know, <laughs> with, his book, with his many boxes. Yes. But anyway, it's been yeah. very successful, I think, since then. And while we missed a few, we've certainly gotten a lot, and uh, uh, we've got some people just in time. Mm -hmm. They're gone. They sure have. Joe Williams had a big hand in this, as you know. Uh, when we decided to go the way we did, we knew that the musicians would would not cooperate because they'd been taken to town so many times. So we. Uh, uh, we had Joe, we had a meeting over in C&D with Joe, and I'm not sure you were there the no, first time. Was, no, Mary and Joe and uh, Dean, I guess, and me. And uh, Joe agreed to, to help out. And so we got him to sign a letter, we went to all the musicians, saying that these guys are for real, you can, but you can bank on it, mm -hmm. don't worry. And that's what got you in. That's, yeah. that's why they agreed to, to, to be interviewed. So we owe a great deal to, to yeah. Joe. But uh, he was all for it. He loved the college. Mm -hmm. He really loved it. And I'll tell you, uh, Sharon Rosengarten is nuts about this place, too, incidentally. Mm -hmm. But I think we've made a lot of friends in the jazz world for I, the college. I know we have. Yeah. Yeah. We have a good reputation out there. Yeah. And uh, and they it, talk about it. They're, they're, they talk about it in public. It's yeah. Well, it was a great comfort for me to be able to to drop Joe's name, you know, when I would call these oh, yeah. the fellows and yeah. that I'm calling yeah. for Joe in Hamilton College. Yeah, yeah, right. Absolutely. Right. Um, we have a saying in my house. Uh, we call it pre-milt. <laughs> 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 and. Uh, we, well, you, you know, know that I think you have the best job in yes, the world, I do. don't you? But, but we can't go there first because that's how I'm going to end this. <laughs> I see. Okay. Um, but if you had uh, to pick out three or four recordings that, that uh, you would have on that proverbial desert island with you, the only thing that you had to listen to, can you think of a couple things that for you really personified the, what the music was about. I know you've had so many. I've uh, been moving your records yeah. around well, as I'd recently. Well, I think Swing Time in the Rockies, Betty Goodman. Mm -hmm. I'd take uh, several bassy tunes. There's so many of them I can't, can't mm -hmm. pick them, really. I, I think the hefty stuff is very good. Yeah. Uh, I take Joe Williams' Our Love is Here to Stay. Mm -hmm. uh, I take uh, Four Brothers from Woody Herman. I won a big bet with that one day, by the way. Yeah? Yeah, I had a... We hired a new... A new uh, Agency, my orange is going to be an ad agency, and we got to talking about jazz. And I said, I know, I know a lot of jazz guys, and so on and so forth. The guy said, Well, I'll put you to the test. So he brought in the record of the Four Brothers, and they set it up in the room next door. A couple of weeks later, and he brought me. He said, Now, what is this? 
I says, that's the four brothers. <laughs> Why do we even remember that I named the four sex players? <laughs> All he right. died. All right. He died. <laughs> well, I, that's, a, that's a sterling tune. Mm -hmm. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, Ellington. I, t I take a... Uh, I take a medley of all his stuff, which he always does on his concerts, you know, mm -hmm. just go through the whole bunch. And I take the menu and then crescendo in blue for uh, the tremendous sax part mm -hmm. of Paul Gonzalez. Yeah. Incidentally, I saw that saw them once. I think it was at uh, Monterey. They had an intermission, and Paul came back, and he was stoned. He either drunk or out on dope, something. And he came back, and he sat there at the stand. Just out of it, everybody's playing away, you know, playing the set, and they started the menu and crescendo and blue, and they played. They got to the sax section. And all of a sudden, the sax solo. All of a sudden, he came to. He stood up and he played his brains out. You know, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me um, ask you about one of the, I think, has to be one of the great things in this part of your life, and that is Nikki. Yes. Yes. Uh, there's an interesting story about the longevity of how long you two actually knew each other. It was quite a while, but we, we don't like to add up the years, really. Uh -huh. we, uh, we first met in the eighth grade at John Marshall High School in Rochester, New York. And uh, we have uh, known of each other since. We uh, came apart after uh, college, when I went to college and she went to college. We met again in Buffalo when I went up to sign up in the Navy, enlist in the Navy. That's another story. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ran into her and we knew each other. Mm -hmm. And we'd have gotten married then, but she didn't return my phone call. <laughs> anyway, uh, okay. so it went on, and then a few years ago, I was in Rochester uh, visiting my sister, and with my old friend, whom you've met, Bob Steamer, who had the band with me, uh, we were at a place, and a guy came and said, by the way, Nelma Chauncey, which is Nikki's real name, lives on my street. And she's a widow, and and she does a lot of gardening and so on and so forth. And so on the way back, I, I, I said to my friend, I said, you know, I, I'm really, really curious about Nelma. I haven't seen her in years. And I, I get, get her address for me, will you, so I can write her a note. Mm -hmm. So I did, and she did, and there you go. She bewitched me. I see. But she's the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. She's. She's been a wonderful, she's, she's gotten into jazz right up to here. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she has befriended and been befriended by all my jazz friends. And uh, she's just a hell of a woman. Mm -hmm. Right? You did that right. Okay. You got that right. <laughs> and I enjoyed playing at your wedding, by the way. That's right. That's and right. And just so that everyone knows that your your theme song as you walked down the aisle was things ain't what they used to be. That's right. <laughs> That's right. But, you know, I got that idea from uh, uh, Dick Gibson's daughter. When she was married, he said, "I'll get any any group of musicians you want to play for your wedding." So she picked six or seven of the top guys. Uh -huh. And they played at a wedding. I thought, now that's a clever thing to do. Yeah, that's where you came in, Steve. <laughs> I was in good company then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and that's what they played when she walked down the aisle. No kidding. Yeah. yeah. Well, Milt, you've uh, made for an amazing legacy, I think. Well, let's hope so. And uh, I um, I wanted to thank you on a, on a couple levels. First of all, for all the people that will 
access this, this wealth of material that we have here because, uh, as you said yesterday, there's nothing exactly like this no that word. we have here. And so it's going to be something that's going to last for a long, long time. And, I sincerely uh, hope so. Yeah. So you've done a real service for that. And then uh, I have to thank you on a personal level because, <laughs> as, as, as I've said, uh, there is actually, a you know, in my house we, we talk about the time before I met you and, yeah. and the amazing uh, influence that you've had on my life and uh, that I have the best job that I could ever conceive of. Uh, being well, you've earned it. You've yeah. done very, very well. The only thing I can think of that's like it in my life is the Metropole Cafe. Mm. It has essentially the same thing. That you're exposed to all these people, and right. and of course you've been exposed on a more personal level. But mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure you found that there that it's a rich, rich field for acquaintances. I mean, they're they're just wonderful people. Yes, it, it's so curious. I mean, we have done. Uh, 190 uh -huh. to date. And when I think back on it, the unpleasant experiences I've had with these musicians are on one hand. Yeah. Yeah. And that is really saying something. Yeah. Well, uh, the people we've dealt with have have a talent. They've got a, they've all got a God-given talent. And that that makes them different. Mm -hmm. You know. I, I look at guys like uh, Haggart and and uh, Ralph Sutton and guys like that who, who who were drunks when they were young. You know, mm -hmm. they more than drank their share. But the guys who made it got smart and got off that stuff. And the mm -hmm. ones who've lasted, the ones that we're dealing with, have all wised up from that. They've had yeah. that experience. And, right. And. Uh, they make wonderful friends, they really do. Yeah. And, and uh, I'm very attached to a lot of them. Right. Uh, and so is Nikki. Nikki. Nikki and Sharon Rosengarten are like sisters. They call mm -hmm. each other sisters, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I think, I think it, I, I know that you've done a great job and I'm, I'm Damned if I'm not going to be sure that you stay on here, <laughs> and you know because because that's the key really, mm -hmm. because the musicians all know you, you know now, they you're Camel in college. I'm not. Well, it's amazing. I you can know. argue about that. Uh, no, no, <laughs> really, no. I I go to some place and, and say something about Hamilton and look at me and say, isn't that where Monk Row is? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's where Monk Row is, and. Or isn't that Monk's College? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's right, yeah. and that's yeah. fine because you, you know you're the you're the queen bee around which all this operates. And I my desire, as is, as of yesterday too, is to try and get this damn thing on a basis where you're safe and secure, and the thing is okay mm -hmm. to go on. Uh, well, I for for public note, I won't say any more about it. Right. But you know what I mean. Right. Well, I, I just uh, am humbled to have a part in such a, an operation, and I love it when I see how jazz has spread all over the world. Yeah. It's been it's yeah. like an international thing now. Yeah, it's terrific Something in Europe. That this country uh, can be very proud of, and uh, I think it's it has become recognized as an art form. I wish that oh, the, sure I wish the dance halls still existed, yeah. in a sense. Yeah. So yeah, that it could exist in that world also. Well, you know, the the uh, swing dancing is back. Mm -hmm. I thought, wondered if that wouldn't give birth to something, and it has a little bit, but not very much. Yeah. Well, I'm going to give you an opportunity to have the last word here. Do you have any any last words that you'd uh, like to put on tape here? About no, I just it's. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience, a wonderful opportunity to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm everlastingly grateful to you and to the powers that be in this college to make it happen because I don't think it would have happened otherwise. Mm -hmm. and, and we did something that really needs to be done. And uh, 
if we can hold it together, it's going to be very valuable someday. Mm -hmm. And I feel very good about it because it's something that bothered me for a long time. Yeah. And plus the fact you've got my record so you can right. play them. <laughs> they <laughs> relate to most of those people. And yeah. So I wish you well. Well, friend. I wish you well too. And I, I will say of all the people I've met in this project, no one has been more interesting than you. I don't know whether that's a compliment or not. Well, I th I'll accept you it as such. It's a humbling compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs>